Okay, so let's uh, resume. So this is the last talk of this morning. And uh, we have the pleasure to welcome uh, Valentina Parigi, actually from the same lab, uh, the same institute as myself, uh, Laboratoire Castle Rossel. And we'll hear about uh, machine learning for and through femtosecond quantum robotics. So Valentina, sorry. Thank you very much. So I'm very happy to be here today. Uh, and uh, I had to spell that I sit in a comfortable chair because Roberta introduced a lot of things that I'm going to speak about today, so I'm very happy about it. And so, yes, and also as Roberta started with the, uh, I mean, photo picture of collaborator, I start with a picture of our group. Uh, there are some people missing probably, but also, I mean, we are very happy about this picture because this is the first one that we could get together again after COVID period, so it's, uh, uh, we are really happy about it. So I'm part of the multimode quantum optics group in Laboratoire Castel Brossel, and here you see uh, the, all the people that contribute to the work that we do. And uh, actually, we work in a multimode feature, quantum, and that is just to build quantum technology. And we go through uh, quantum computing, continuous variable, quantum metrology, and so on. So there is parts that uh, now it's more dedicated to machine learning, and also to the fact that we want to use machine learning. Uh, for our uh, for our setup, um, and and why? So the main uh, feature, at least of uh, what I do in the group, is to build uh, complex quantum networks and uh, complex in shape uh, and uh, network done uh, of quantum fields. So I will speak a little bit more of it uh, very soon. Uh, where actually, uh, well, the nodes are quantum fields and the link could be physical interaction and tangent links. And this kind of uh, setup, uh, experimental setup, uh, it's uh, nice to think about using it uh, as a platform uh, to implement a quantum version of machine learning. And especially today, I, I'm going to speak about the quantum reservoir computing that uh, is the business that we start to, to work with, uh, with uh, Roberta Mini, actually. And uh, eventually, also, it appeared that we could do some classical pulse reservoir computing in our setup. Uh, I tell eventually because, I mean, we were really more interested in the quantum part, but uh, by discussing uh, with people at IFISC, it uh, was clear that probably we can also do something uh, that we start with the classical. And also, I think it's very important because, especially when you speak about quantum machine learning in general, it's very hard to compare to something. So I guess if in the same setup, uh, with the same kind of resource, you do the classical and the quantum later on, it could be easier uh, to get really a, a comparison of what you're doing. And if you have any kind of advantage, at least on, on, uh, on specific uh, uh, condition. And, uh, uh, and also, actually, uh, well, this is the idea is that you can use continuous variable quantum network to implement quantum machine learning. But also, as again, everyone has told, actually, in the quantum uh, scheme, it's very interesting to have classical machine learning tool, uh, tools for uh, exploring uh, the quantum system that we have, especially to get information about the important quantum feature. And this is uh, uh, the last part. I'm, I'm not really totally sure that in the hour that I have, uh, I will speak about it. Uh, but in any case, I mean, we can uh, we can discuss even uh, later on uh, after after the talk. Uh, okay, just looking at the hour in order to set my myself. Um, uh, and please, at any moment of the talk, if you have a question, please ask me. So uh, I really would like to have, if possible, some kind of interaction even during the talk. Don't just wait at the end to ask questions if you have. Just raise your hands. Um, OK, so I will start. So I want just to uh, make a little bit of uh, idea what I mean with continuous variable multimode. So you already have uh, means from, uh, from Roberta, but I want to, put, to take it from uh, our point of view uh, and how we realize it and more on the experimental, on the experimental platform. So very basics, we are the multimode quantum optics team. So we work with multimodes. Uh, so what is a mode of light is just a solution of Maxwell equation. So here I'm uh, writing a multimode field uh, on the paraxial and narrow band approximation. Uh, and so what does it mean? Just they propagate, light propagates with different polarization, different spatial shape, and different spectral temporal shape. Um, well, if we just consider as it's going to be uh, 
uh, at first the K is just one uh, spectral temporal mode, well, you can start to, to write the field that way, where I, I just put an amplitude on a mod shape that is a temporal field that propagates actually along a specific direct, uh, with a specific key vector and, 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 and omega value or around this omega value. So this is really the, the idea of the paraxial approximation is the fact that the fields they're going to speak about uh, has, I mean, the, the, the wave vector is not far from being from a specific one. And we have a narrow band, so we're very close not to be really on the narrow band approximation you will see in my talk, but still we, are, we, we can consider that this, uh, this approximation is, uh, is valid. Um, well, and, and, and then I just want to go very, very briefly on the continuous variable. So, I'm not quantum here, just I'm just considering the, uh, uh, the, to I mean, the total field. So here what I'm considering is just the uh, propagating uh, uh, part at a positive frequency. So the total field contain the positive frequency and the uh, negative frequency part so that I can write the, the field, the uh, uh, complex conjugate the field. Uh, so here I'm just taking for simplicity the mod shape as real that I can rewrite as a combination of cosinus and sinus wave with Q and P. So this is really what we call quadrature uh, in optical field for the one that, I mean, are not really uh, used to it. And that are just combination of these two uh, am amplitude that could be uh, complex. So you have uh, the uh, imaginary part uh, of, of the field. So these are the continuous variables that I work with. Uh, I, I really start with the classical part because at the beginning I will speak about the classical part, but I mean, this is really the same definition even in, uh, in, the, in, the, in, the quantum, uh, in the quantum case. So what are going to be the modes they're going to use in this talk? So we use, uh, uh, well, let's say in the, at least 90% uh, of the experiment that we do in our lab, mod lock femtosecond laser. Uh, so here I'm just considering one particular one that uh, emits uh, 22 femtosecond pulses that are separated by six nanoseconds, so more or less the repetition rate is uh, 156 uh, megahertz. Uh, and as is a mod lock laser, you can consider in the frequency domain being it as an optical frequency comb. So in particular, this one, uh, we can really uh, uh, stabilize what is the, uh, the, the, the reference frequency. So. Um, well, what we really use in what we do in the lab is the fact that we have many frequency. So uh, we are not really uh, interested in the fact that we have discrete comb line and we are really able to access each of them, but, uh, but really the fact that we have many frequencies that can shape uh, in different mode shape is the, is the thing that we uh, normally use uh, uh, in what we do. Um, so in particular, uh, well, the other mode basis, so, well, the modes of this talk is going to be pulses, uh, you will see all the time, but we can also embed in each of these pulses different uh, frequency temporal modes. And this can be done uh, in the hermit goes basis. And this is, well, I'm telling uh, the one that refer one particular experiment that has um, the first mode. So, it's just, I mean, a uh, 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 Gaussian function that multiply Hermit's polynomials. Uh, and uh, uh, the first one in the basis uh, for the experiment they're going to tell about is more or less around uh, 18 uh, nanometers. Uh, so here I'm giving you in the frequency basis. So the Hermit goes basis, you can, well, I always speak about frequency temporal mode. You can take the Fourier transform. What is nice in the Hermit goes basis that the Fourier transform is exactly in the Hermit goes basis. Uh, and so you can also think about them a uh, different temporal mode shape that are associated at that particular pulse uh, of or a particular time beam that is the pulse coming on the main on the main laser. But I will come back on it uh, more specifically uh, how we can embed this on the on the system. And the idea is really that these modes are the system, or if you want the harmonic oscillator that are going to uh, uh, build uh, the network that they use. That at the beginning is going to be classical, but, uh, but then it's going to, be, to become a quantum, uh, quantum network. Uh, so with this, uh, I will start by uh, speaking about the uh, classical uh, uh, pulse reservoir computing that, uh, that we have done very recently. Uh, and, and, and that is going to be used just the pulses uh, as, uh, as the modes. 
Um, so I start with the very basic of reservoir computing, as I had to do, uh, being a newcomer in this uh, in this field. So probably I'm going to repeat uh, many of the things that Roberta uh, told, but probably also come to more kind of experimental point of view because we wanted to implement it in the lab. So. Uh, here is one of the pictures, so it's not far uh, from what Roberta uh, told. We have an input layer, we have a substrate, so what we call reservoir, output layer, and the target. And as uh, we have seen in the previous talk, it's very efficient for temporal tasks, for approximating time, time C, temporal series of finite, past, uh, sorry, finite number of past inputs. And uh, there are two uh, main features that you need on the reservoir. You need to have a reservoir that's nonlinearly transform the input signal into an eight-dimensional state space and should possess some uh, memory, uh, short-term uh, memory. So you should remember of, uh, the, recent, uh, the recent past. And what, I mean, especially being an experimentalist, uh, it's very nice that uh, in kind of reservoir computing, you have not to train uh, the reservoir, uh, but just to train the, the output layer. So, I start to write uh, very simple maths, probably for the one that's uh, expert in machine learning here, I'm just uh, uh, telling very, very, very basic, but uh, to me it's interesting to go to the uh, uh, experimental implementation there. So here I'm writing the reservoir state. Uh, so this is a vector of all the nodes of the reservoir that should be a nonlinear function. Then you have uh, uh, an input, uh, probably, yes, here is going to be uh, easier. Uh, you have an input connectivity vector that uh, can be traced from a normal distribution that is, uh, in a way, is random at a fixed weight uh, that multiply actually the, the input uh, the input layer, uh, and then you have the Asiatic symmetrics of the reservoir that multiply the reservoir state at time step k minus one. So this is a, a very basic receipt uh, for having a reservoir state. The output weights are going to be. Uh, in this output layer, uh, transform uh, from the reservoir state uh, through, uh, sorry, the output uh, layer uh, through the output weight, uh, it, uh, it, I mean, gives you the, uh, uh, the value that you, want to, uh, that you want to learn. And this has to be, so this output weight has to be trained uh, in order to get the target function. And this can be done uh, just by linear inversion or regression. You have uh, many different uh, uh, also way, but a very simple one, uh, given uh, a set of training data. Uh, so then you have a validation set, and you can uh, well test what you have done via a normalized root mean square error that just take the mean square uh, root and normalize by the variance of the data that you are using. So this is kind of very simple receipt that I retain to build the reservoir computing. Uh, so we decide to realize a particular uh, kind of reservoir computing, the one that is uh, based on the real feedback and it's very close to, uh, uh, to this uh, natural communication paper that uh, comes from the discussion that we had with uh, Miguel Soriano at, uh, at, the, at IFISC in the, in the group of, uh, of Roberta. And so the idea is that the reservoir here are these are virtual nodes that are distributed in time, that are separated by the time uh, theta. Uh, and so uh, the state of the reservoir at time Tn, uh, I mean, the end time depends actually on the time span. So it's k time, the uh, time span of the reservoir plus j uh, uh, theta. And uh, so also we have to implement the link between these different virtual nodes and we retain one of the uh, possibility, which is to have non-instantaneous system uh, that are characterized by a, a characteristic time. So that actually if you want here, what I'm writing in this part, so this is the, uh, the state of the reservoir, uh, JK, what I'm uh, writing here is just what you had before for the regular uh, reservoir computing. Uh, but you have to consider that you have a portion that comes from the nodes that is just before in time into one reservoir. So uh, just, uh, uh, I mean, this time space is just theta. Uh, that actually has a weight that depends actually on the ratio, on the exponential ratio uh, between the uh, uh, time between actually the uh, two different nodes, and also actually the characteristic times of, well, the, the physical, uh, let's say, quantity 
that I'm looking at that particular node. So probably it's going to be a little bit more easy to understand if I go directly on the uh, implementation. So uh, what we did is to take uh, the pulses of our laser and to use them as the, uh, well, the nodes of this time delayed uh, uh, feedback reservoir computing. So the idea is that uh, what you see coming out from, so here you have a, an electro-optic modulator that is uh, uh, giving some phases on uh, the pulse uh, itself, uh, combine it with a, a feedback signal that come from uh, the detection. So the detection for us is a homodyne detection. So this is, a, uh, I mean, the most important, let's say, uh, measurement device that we, we have uh, because this is really what measure the continuous variable, the quadrature P and Q. So this is the reference field. If you want to measure P and Q, you make them, uh, uh, you mix them on a splitter with a local oscillator, the reference pin. So we often use portion of the main of the same laser that we use to do the process that we want to do in the lab. Uh, and then by setting the phase between these two uh, fields, uh, you can you can get the measurement either X or Q or combination of N, uh, sorry, Q and P. Uh, so in particular. What we are doing here is to measure, so actually the pulse that comes is the node. I remember this is really the one that we want to use to embed the state of the reservoir. Uh, we measure the P quadrature. So this sets the nonlinear function, it's just a sine function, not so linear, of actually uh, the, uh, uh, the incoming uh, uh, signal. And then actually is related to the pulse before by the fact that we have a finite bandwidth of the homodyne detection. So the, the way actually we uh, embed the fact that we create links uh, uh, effectively between the different nodes that are the paths of our reservoir is the fact that the measurement that we do on the reservoir, so on the state space actually, is going to depend on the one that comes before because actually the measurement device is set to be not fast enough. Uh, so, so this is a more refined picture uh, of uh, the experimental setup. So this is our uh, titanium sulfide laser. So probably I didn't uh, tell, but we work in the near infrared regime, so around 800 nanometers. Here we have a dispersion compensation, but it's just to set actually the, um, uh, let's say, a proper phase for the local oscillator. And then we go through the homodyne, uh, where we encounter the uh, 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 but the signal and the encoding actually is done by, uh, uh, by putting actually uh, the phase on each pulse. So each pulse is a particular phase uh, that is given by the electro-optic modulator. And uh, this comes from a mixing of the input. So this is really the input, is the input series that you use is the one that I was calling UK at the beginning. And actually the feedback that come uh, from uh, the homodyne detection uh, through a uh, different parameter that we can tune this uh, beta and, and alpha uh, in order actually to, uh, to, to train uh, uh, our uh, reservoir computing. Um, so this is just to give you the idea of what does it mean that we are generating link uh, by a um, system that is slow enough. Uh, so you have actually the pulse that are played to, uh, I mean, the phase that is apl applied to each pulse. I'm not sure that you can read from, because probably it's a little bit uh, too small. But here you have a particular time series that corresponds to the black line is the phase that you want to put in your pulse. And then the red line is what the homodyne detection is, the response of the homodyne detection. And you can see, for example, if you just look at this particular phase, that is, the, the res I mean, the response of the homodyne detection is a little bit lower. And this is because actually it depends a little bit on the value that it has before, that is decaying through, uh, I mean, uh, zero, but it's not already at zero when you uh, actually uh, send the second, uh, well, the second phase that you want to impede in your data. Uh, and so actually, this value is a mixture of what was before and what uh, is going to be uh, later on. And uh, uh, so uh, what uh, we have done is to test, I don't know, do you have questions? Because I'm not sure. Yes, of course. Um, I'm making this a quick question. Yeah. But so, so you have this, this ring picture? 
uh, type of the parts is kind of different around, but is that, is that not a sort of a linear train that is traveling when you do the measurement? So actually, what you have, yes, is a linear train, or yeah, just, I mean, you can imagine that it's easier just a mirror just to, to, to send actually the light to the homode and the texture. But actually, what is you have a train of pulses coming, and what you are doing is the measurement on this train of pulses. Uh, the idea is that uh, the way you encode the information of the input series is really the phase of the pulses. So each pulse is, uh, I mean, comes after six, nan six nanoseconds, and so every six nanoseconds, the EUM changes status action. The, that's, uh, and actually, the, this phase uh, depends on the input, but also we have a feedback that comes back from what is measured there. The measurement itself is the one that generates the link between the different nodes. So each, each pulse is a node. But you use each pulse only once, so it doesn't. Sorry. No, actually, no, no, yes, you're right, because I mean, I, I will come to it. So the feedback is done electronically. So what you can think to do is, for example, yes, you can feedback the pulse itself. If you're able to measure, uh, or at least, for example, to partially measure and then to send, best, send it back. Uh, but we are doing actually electronic feedback here. And actually, the length of this cable is the one that limits the number of nodes that you have uh, into the reservoir. But pulses after round three, they leave the system. That was the question, right? Well, the pulses are here are measured, so they don't and exist then, anymore. They're not anymore. But you can imagine kind of system that probably is going to be more on the quantum version, in which you have a bit splitter, you measure parts of the signal, and then you feed back the rest. Or you can directly, yes, yes, this is a, the main the name point. And I will also show, I mean, a paper later on that does exactly this. You have other question on uh... okay if not uh, so well the test that we did uh, was one very typical test that is done uh, for reservoir computing so it's an ARMA test so actually we did an ARMA 5 test so we, we draw uh, uh, the input data from a uniform distribution uh, in the interval 0 0.5 and then we use this particular target function, uh, which is actually a function of uh, the input data also at the uh, short past and also on the uh, uh, function itself at the, at the short past. Uh, and uh, actually what we did is to optimize, for example, the bandwidth. So actually we have a, a maximal bandwidth of our detec detector, which is 100 megahertz, uh, but in principle we can reduce it. Of course, you put filters. And the optimized one for getting uh, the best reservoir computing, just to, to give you again the idea, is that the bandwidth, by, by uh, changing the bandwidth, in a way we are intrinsically changing uh, the strength of the link between the different, the different nodes. Um, and we have one that is optimized around uh, 22 megahertz. We uh, did a very limited reservoir, uh, which is uh, 35 nodes, uh, and uh, actually, this is actually the uh, uh, best uh, error that we got, which is around four, uh, 0 0.45. So this is very far from the state of the art, that uh, in this kind of system uh, could be below 0 0.1. Uh, uh, and uh, we know actually that you are mainly limited by uh, the size of our reservoir. So, uh, while well, we are mainly limited by uh, the length of the cable for the electronic feedback, uh, because actually it's very nice when you do this, where you try to do very specific tasks that could be uh, so fancy, so on, and then you discover the very basic physics. So, the fact that, of course, actually, well, you're doing that by using uh, 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 the BNC cable. And then you have attenuation at a certain point, and this is why also actually now for communication we use optical fibers, not electronic uh, cables. But uh, in a way, it's nice to rediscover. Yes. How long is it? Oh, it's something like uh, 40 meters. Uh, if I do, yes, you have to consider that actually you have each pulse is uh, the pulses are separated by six nanoseconds, so you take six nanoseconds by 35, uh, and then you see uh, more or less uh, what is the length of the cable. Uh, yeah, we were trying to do kind of uh, to enforce to uh, I mean have larger lengths uh, in order to see. Of course, at a certain point you get attenuation, 
that yes, uh, we are really limited uh, by the, uh, also the uh, signal to noise ratio that you get at the end, as we have a very good homodyne detection detector, because the one that we are using has been uh, dev I mean, devised for uh, quantum purposes, so the reality that you really have to see very uh, very little signal, and the signal to noise ratio is, is very I mean is very uh, important on this field. Uh, so we're trying to, to use longer cable, but at a certain point you would like to need some kind of amplification, which is not really actually... Uh, the idea of this experiment was really to, to see what we can set in the classical scenario. But also uh, uh, we, uh, in a way, uh, try to uh, play with it because we uh, use it for another task, which is a user case. Uh, which is to get the laser intensity related dynamics. So actually, uh, the, in the experiments, what we have is that the titanium sulfide laser is pumped by a solid state laser. And it's very well known that uh, uh, the uh, noise uh, on the uh, power of this laser is going to change the noise property of uh, the laser itself. And particularly, so the PhD students that did the reservoir computing actually during his PhD was really developing a technique for studying all the uh, different uh, noise parameters at the same time via actually a multi-pixel homodyne detection uh, that is able to, to see a different frequency bands, uh, actually the noise uh, and also the covariance between the different frequency bands. And this can be directly reduced to getting the parameters so the noise on different parameters of the laser. Uh, so I'm not going to go into details in it, but if you have questions, I can, I can answer uh, later. So particularly here, what we can do is to consider, actually, we can measure directly the, uh, the input noise, so the, the pump noise, the intensity noise, and recover by the technique uh, the intensity noise of the laser, uh, the, uh, the noise of the uh, FCO uh, frequency, and uh, the noise of the central on the central frequency. So what it, we did is to, uh, to use this as the input data and try our reservoir computed by limited one with 35 nodes to learn actually uh, the noise that come out on the three different parameter of the, of the system. So uh, these are the simulation that Mathieu did uh, before, uh, I mean, was reservoir computing embedded on a computer. Uh, and it seems to work, actually, even if the error actually still is quite, quite high, but, but this, I, I guess that especially for the uh, simulation, this can be uh, really improved. And we tested uh, with the experiments, so really the parts going on, and uh, we are able to actually to simulate. It worked for two parameters of the three that we tested. We still don't know why the, the other one didn't, didn't work. But they're really able to uh, uh, get to learn actually the, the laser parameter noise during uh, during time actually. So what I was showing here, so this is really the, the idea of time series is how actually the noise change during time, and then you have the noise of the two different parameters that change during time according to the relation that they have with the input noise, and this is really what the reservoir computing learn and is able to reproduce actually the, the signal. You have questions. Well, what's the error in this So the error is, yes, in the mean square error. Uh, so again, I mean, we find more or less is around 0 0.4, which is what, uh, what we got from the NARMA test. But uh, we really didn't uh, push very far this architecture in the sense that probably, so we know that uh, the, main, uh, the main limitation for us is really the 30, 35 nodes. Uh, uh, as we have an electronic feedback. But in principle, you can think about other strategy uh, in which you can use uh, uh, optical feedback. And particularly, so what I'm showing here in this slide is, uh, 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 I mean, this is a published paper in, in the group of Serge Massa, uh, where actually, I mean, they were using the very similar encoding. When I speak about the similar encoding is the fact that uh, the input tray, I mean, input data are encoded in the phase uh, of your field and that you measure at the end amplitude. So what is very typical in a photonic reservoir computing setup that you measure intensity, um, not really the amplitude of the field. And also the fact that they use a very similar source because it's a frequency comb. 
what is a telecom wavelength, and I mean the the comba very much. Uh, uh, the, the spacing is very large in, in frequency, uh, but they use the comb uh, of the uh, of the frequency comb as the nodes while we were using the pulse, and they use uh, an optical feedback. So let's say actually the philosophy of the two setup is very similar. Uh, they got uh, better results, but I mean this is what's really tuned to uh, to do uh, uh, good reservoir computing. Uh, even if on some parameters uh, we are better than than them, since actually in the case of uh, we saturate before in signal to noise ratio, but of course I mean the main limitation for us is that we implement with just uh, 35 uh, 35 nodes. Can, can you elaborate on that? So <laughs> you're talking uh, about 35 nodes and saying that it is length of the cable, right? Yeah. So why don't you take longer cable? Because we start to have too many losses. Too many losses. So this is what exactly the reason we're saying that we discovered why actually at that point we use optical fiber to do communication, not electronic cable anymore. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, but in electronics, you also can have gain. I mean, you yeah, of course. Gain. Yes, you're right. We didn't want to push so far. I mean, mm -hmm. because this is where really the purpose to to set actually, especially the classical setup mm -hmm. to compare with the quantum one. But, but in principle, yes, and uh, this could be uh, one, uh, one option. Can you use radio frequency? Sorry? Can you use radio frequency instead of cable? Uh, Simple modulation. Probably, yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you're right. Just collaboration. There's not a... Ah, yes, of course. <laughs> Okay, so this is was uh, our setting of the classical reservoir computer. Well, we are, we're very happy because even with the limited amount of uh, resource, we were able to get some results. So especially the simulation actually of the uh, noise laser, I think it's a it's a it's a nice uh, it's a nice result. Um, and then we come with the uh, with the quantum. So uh, in the quantum case, uh, well, the idea is really that we are going to use train of pulses and to embed different uh, modes uh, on one on one pulse, so on each pulse, which is really actually the kind of setup that uh, uh, Roberta was uh, was telling us uh, maybe at the end of the, uh, of the talk. Uh, where I come back to the multi-mode picture by telling that here I'm going quantum, as, as everyone going from classical to quantum, you put hat everywhere, so you have just uh, uh, operator instead of amplitude, and in particular Q and P are going to be actually combination of uh, the annihilation and creation operator of the harmonic oscillator, uh, and uh, we, our convention, uh, of definition of QNP uh, is the one where actually the commutator is too, uh, is too high. And the reason why is just because when you use this convention, you have that uh, the noise of the vacuum state of the local oscillator uh, in both quadrators is going to be one. So, I mean, the Heisenberg limit is the variance of Q uh, times the variance of P is larger, uh, more than one, which is the short noise limit, the vacuum noise that we take that uh, it's always used when, well, I mean, always, often used when, uh, when you work with squeeze state of light, because the comparison with one is very much uh, easy. So, uh, and then actually, of course, there are many things that goes uh, in the quantum regime that are different on the classical one, and we are really interested on what is going on on the, uh, uh, on the right side. So we, we use continuous variable description of the field, and so here really that comes from the Eisenberg limit that you have no more point on the phase space, but you have a certain area. So actually what is used for quantum uh, system to characterize uh, the state here are mainly Wigner functions. So when Roberta was speaking about Gaussian states, what are Gaussian states are the one that has this Gaussian Wigner function that really gives actually the uh, statistical distribution of quadrature in the phase space in the quantum case. So for the ones that are not used to it, you can really use as a uh, joint probability distribution in the classical case in the sense that you can use them to get uh, expectation value in the very same sense. They are a little bit special because they can have value that are uh, lower than zero. So it's not like a joint probability distribution, but this is really what is nice because uh, these two is linked to the kind of quantum advantage. So it's know that for having any kind of quantum computational advantage in the uh, uh, quantum in computation setting, you need at least non-Gaussian distribution, 
probably also need some negative Wigner function uh, on, that, uh, on that scenario. Um, and so what uh, we use too in our system is uh, nonlinear optical processes. So optical parameter down conversion. Uh, so you have pump field that uh, is down converted to signal hydro field. So here you have uh, the Hamiltonian of the process. This is very much well known. And when you are in a degenerate uh, condition, what you get is exactly the squeeze state, uh, uh, which is, as Roberta was telling me before, the one in which actually you have squeezed uh, the noise of one quadrature uh, uh, while you are increasing the one of the other uh, by maintaining uh, uh, the, uh, uh, well, the minimum uncertainty in the sense of the product of the two. Uh, but when you are not degenerating this uh, um, picture, what you get uh, is uh, quadrature entangled states. So this is the kind of, uh, so it's very much approximated, uh, entangled state that it's uh, used in the continuous variable approach. So you have a correlation uh, uh, between the uh, uh, x uh, quadrature of two fields that are coming out so here, for example, two different frequency. And you have anti-correlation on the uh, uh, p uh, quadrature. So this is really the way how we build the network, the quantum network we're speaking at the beginning. So the one that we normally uh, build in the lab that you are interested in, and we think that is interesting for doing uh, some uh, quantum machine learning. Uh, so in order to get many link, so what we do is that uh, we pump the optical process with the optical frequency comp. So again is the fact that we have many different frequency. So here's just the multi-mode uh, Hamiltonian of, uh, of the process. And uh, if you, uh, so this is just ideally spread the different colors at the output, uh, and you look at the uh, correlation between the different color, what you get is entanglement. But you always have a particular mode basis that for us is the Hermitgos basis in which actually you have a set of squeeze states uh, of light. So in order to give uh, more insight on this picture, what I'm speaking about, uh, here I'm showing, so this is uh, a different system that we have, but uh, I'm using it because then to explain exactly this, uh, this picture is, is a little bit easier, uh, but it's the same idea uh, as before in the sense that we have uh, uh, a femtosecond laser that is a frequency comb uh, that is the pump of the optical process that here is in a cavity in order to enhance the interaction with the nonlinear process. Uh, and at the output, uh, you can measure uh, via homodyne detection. In particular, here you can measure, you can do homodyne detection at different wavelengths uh, simultaneously via yeah, this multi pixel homodyne detection uh, of the system. So, what is going on if I just consider one particular wavelength on frequency of the pump is that I'm producing actually, uh, I mean, twin fields that are entangled. This is exactly what it is, uh, uh, I mean, for the parametric process as before. But you have many lines. So, what I can do is to entangle, for example, this yellow line by producing it with uh, this greener line with the second uh, line of the comb. So all the line of the comp are going to produce many different correlations. And at the end, I get a full spectrum. And I want actually to, uh, to look at the correlation between the different wavelengths. And I can do it by just looking at the variance, the covariance of the quadrature at different color, because I know that I'm producing a Gaussian state of light. So I just need actually uh, the uh, correlation up to the second order. So here, just to tell that we don't really, uh, well, we don't really see all the line of the comp, but we see slice of the freak of the, well, of the bandwidth. Uh, and we look at the correlation between these different colors in the multi-pixel, and you get this kind of uh, uh, covariance matrices for the uh, Q quadrature and the P quadrature. And then, I mean, you can diagonalize them. This corresponds to making the diagonalization of the Hamiltonian that I was showing here. But what you get, if you get a diagonal covariance matrix, is that you can just get squeezing or anti-squeezing, depending if you are uh, below or uh, higher than zero, because here is renormalized. So actually, we subtract the noise of the vacuum, uh, which is one in our, uh, in our convention. 
So this means that uh, by doing this diagonalization, you go from a system in which you have entanglement, because you have, uh, uh, I mean, actually on the diagonal, uh, you get the variance uh, of the quadrature, while on the off-diagonal term, you get correlation that can be used to build entanglement measure, and you see that you really have entanglement in the different uh, line. And when you go on this picture, you just get a bunch of squeeze state of light. And the basis change corresponds to go from, uh, I mean, pixel in the sense of different wavelengths to the Hermite-Gauss basis. So this means that the system here is a bunch of squeeze state of light. The system here is a particular entanglement configuration. So the basis change, meaning the basis that you use to look at your system, is the one that is changing actually the entanglement property. And this is when you have Gaussian state of light in continuous variable, is really the trick that is used to go from squeezing to entanglement and to change the kind of entanglement that you can build. And in particular, uh, it's used, for example, to, uh, to build large uh, entanglement network that are named cluster states that in the uh, measure-based quantum computing scenario are used uh, for, um, I mean, as, uh, uh, well, as a resource uh, for the computing itself, even if they are not enough. Uh, and these, I mean, I'm showing just different setups that use this trick. So, for example, in this setup, you have different squeezing um, uh, states that belong to different uh, time beams. And then you mix the time beams, the bin splitter and the ley line. So it's a basis change. So if you think of bin splitter, you just think, take two fields. At the out, you have uh, the sum and the difference. So you, it's just, I mean, a basis change uh, with respect to the uh, initial basis. And in this way, you can engineer the entanglement uh, correlation. So at this point, normally I tell that here you have entanglement, these are the biggest ones. So they contain millions of nodes. And usually what I was used to say at this point is that, well, they're very nice, but they're not so versatile because you cannot really change the link between the nodes. Well, this is, has been done very recently. So the last boson sampling experiment from Xanadu uh, is able to generate also arbitrary, uh, uh, I mean, using this time multiplexing scenario arbitrary, uh, let's say, uh, network of cluster. And then you have the one that uses the frequency of the frequency comb. And this is actually is what has done in our, uh, uh, in our lab, in our group, uh, uh, by, by Nicola Treps uh, some years ago. Uh, and here, really, by doing the basis change at the level of the homodyne detection, what is named the homodyne detection, you can, can, you can choose the basis by changing actually the shape of the local oscillator itself. Meaning that if you want to measure, for example, the fact you have squeezing on a particular Hermit goes mode, you just shape your local oscillator that way because it's an interference technique. So it's, it's selecting the mode that you're measuring. So in a way, in a multi-mode scenario, by engineering the, the basis, you can get different shape of entanglement link. And so, and that, that way I arrived to the system that I, I really meant to use uh, in the uh, kind of scenario that Roberta was telling before, uh, which is, uh, um, uh, again, a parametric process in a single pass configuration, uh, meaning that we don't have any cavity. So normally, uh, the idea is that for having very large amount of squeezing, uh, the you know, linear crystal is put in a cavity. So this is the optical parametric oscillator scenario. But here, uh, I mean, normally what it does, for example, in our case, the cavity uh, is to filter uh, and not being uh, sensitive to each pulse, meaning that the squeeze state of light that you produce with the cavity setup belongs to a mode that contains, is the cavity mode that contains, for example, 30 pulse. Here we want to be fast. We want to be able to produce squeeze state of light for each pulse. So this is why we use a single pass configuration. We use periodically for uh, KTP crystal in waveguides in order to gain no linearity that we lose because we're removing the cavity. Uh, and this is the same, so this is the, the frequency doubled version of the laser that we're using for the uh, uh, reservoir computing. So here you have uh, 150 uh, megahertz repetition rate, and we produce squeezing at each pulse. But we do more because in any case, so this is uh, our uh, mod log pulse laser, so this means that it has large bandwidth. So we are producing squeezing uh, at 
different frequency modes as before. So we are going to get from here the same kind of covariance matrices that we were showing before, that diagonalizing them, you get exactly actually, in this case, 21 modes that are squeezed. Uh, and here you have uh, the squeezing trace uh, uh, taken from, uh, with a spectrum analyzer that directly give you, uh, well, uh, variances of the field at the output of the homodyne, and you compare it with the vacuum state, this is the gray, and you see that you have squeezing, meaning that you go below. Here you are just scanning the phase of the local oscillator, meaning that here I'm measuring x and p, x and p quadrature. And this is just the trace that we get for two of the modes by sending actually one of these two modes on the homodyne detection. So the homodyne detection selects by changing the, um, uh, the shape of the spectrum, the modes that we want to measure so we can test that we have a squeeze mode. Uh, and in this experiment, we got up to 21 squeeze modes. So the squeezing is not too large. Uh, for the moment, so for sure, you're not going to do uh, quantum computing with this, uh, with this squeezing. Uh, but the idea is that uh, for, for do some kind of proof of principle experiments, just to compare, I mean, if you have some squeezing compared to the fact that you don't have squeezing, uh, probably you don't see uh, so much enhancement, but you should see some enhancement as far as you're able to measure so that the detection is uh, uh, sensitive, uh, sensitive enough. And this is really uh, the, the thing that is going to be used, uh, uh, I mean, in collaboration with the, the group of IFISC in order to, uh, to set actually this quantum reservoir computing with uh, continuous variables. So here I'm just showing a two of the picture that Roberta was showing before uh, by just recalling that uh, you can probably get some uh, larger uh, information capacity when you do squeeze state compared to Korean states. So the Korean state here, is exactly the classical reservoir computing that I was showing before. Uh, because we were, uh, actually, it's not this one, it's this one. And actually, is thanks to this paper that is, we decide to encode in the phase and not in the amplitude by choosing to measure in the classical co uh, computing the p quadrature that is linked to the phase uh, and not the q quadrature that is linked to the amplitude of the, uh, of the field. Um, I think I'm not going on the last one because it's better to take time for question. I just want to tell that we are very much interested on classical machine learning technique uh, to uh, test uh, our quantum state. I just give you one slide idea on what I mean. Uh, so I was telling that as far as we use this system and we make measurements, we have Gaussian state of, of, of uh, light meaning that the Wigner function is Gaussian. Uh, we can do particular process that I'm not going to speak about. They can degaussify uh, the, the system, meaning that at the output of this process is an heralded process with another nonlinear uh, operation. You can get some of these modes that, that are non-Gaussian. And the trick is that you can also do this operation on system, which is a bunch of nodes. And if you want to, so here you have just a cluster of four harmonic oscillator, and then you do a degaussifying operation on one node, but it's going to affect also the other because you have entanglement correlation. If you want to understand the system, so in principle, you have to reconstruct a Wigner function which is in a, lives in a four dimensional space. This is what is done normally with what is called quantum homodyne tomography, doing maximum likelihoods. But as far as you go to four modes, uh, I mean, it's impossible to, it's computationally impossible to do. And so what have done people is start to use, for example, artificial neural network for doing it. Here I'm spotting two papers that probably start to be old, in which actually use neural network in tomography by really encoding uh, for example, the, uh, the amplitude and the phase of the wave function, uh, and then you do some kind of gradient ascent descent method in order to, to get from uh, Max Lick actually what, what, is the, uh, what is the idea. What we did is something more simple, is just to ask to a neural network by giving him the data if we have or not a negative Wigner function, and it was really efficient. 
And with this, I just stop. Then if you're interested, you can uh, speak later about this, uh, about this part. And thank you for your attention. Thank you, Valentina. The call is open for questions. Also online, by the way. Huh? So it's, if people online have questions, we, we don't see the chat, so you just have to unmute and speak. Speak live. Yes. Thank you for the presentation. I just wonder if you have any uh, dependence on the number of nodes, like the performance, uh, because you, you are limited to the table, right? The number of the table, which is a limitation. But if you reduce the number of cable, so will this the performance significantly drop, or maybe this is already a separation point? I, I guess you have, I mean, depending on the task, you have a saturation. It's also the reason why, for example, we're testing with the NARMA 5 and not the NARMA 10, because the NARMA 10 was not working with the 30. Then, I mean, if, uh, linear, if it's linear quadratic or not, and not expert enough on reservoir computing to tell you, uh, I can just tell you that uh, practically we see that there is some limit that comes from the number of nodes, depending on the task that we want to perform. Yes. Yes. How do you select them when you have an important So we select at the level of the measurement, in the sense that when we characterize them, uh, we select the, so the modes are defined with different spectral shapes. So we define this spectral shape for the local oscillators. We do ultra fast shaping of the local oscillator. And then, I mean, uh, it, it is a mode selecting technique that the way we are sure that we are just measuring. But the measure is the way also we generate actually the, the interaction between the different modes. Yeah, since so the level of the measurement, yes. Yes. Well, thank you for the presentation. Uh, I didn't quite get the, what are the input features for the reservoir, the quantum input features in the time series? Yeah, because I, I, did, I didn't tell for the quantum case, in the sense, ah. well, I'm referring to the fact that... Uh, the case, well, the classic case actually is, is just, uh, is the phase of the pulse. So actually, well, depending on the task, you have a, a time series, you have the input and the output that you yeah. want to select, and the inputs are just given uh, to the electro-optic modulator that set the phase of the pulse. And the pulse, I mean, the phase of the pulse is what we measure by measuring the P quadrature, actually we measure the sign of the phase, because that way we also have some nonlinearity at the level, uh, I mean, of the measurements. So. Do you think, uh, and this is just a question, do you think this system would improve if we input as well the frequency modes? Uh, in the classical case? Yeah, in the classical case. Well, this is more or less, well, yes. Uh, in my experiment, the problem is that um, well, in principle, yes, I have to be yeah, mode selective. Okay. Yes, so the fact is that I have, I have to find a way to give uh, different information on the different frequency modes. And the most natural way to me is to go to the parametric process, but there I'm already considering the quantum case. Uh, but in principle, yes, I mean, in a way you multiplex. This is exactly what we do for the quantum case, that is that we multiplex. Uh, but then in the classical case, I don't know how to modify, I should need some non-classical feature, I think. Um, thank you. <laughs> uh, thank you for the talk. Um, you mentioned it's possible to do some uh, optical feedback as well, and there was this other I'm working on that. I guess you use you, not a method to encode the information on the pulses, right? You don't use an electrical one laser. Um, I wonder what, like, how would that look like? Uh, um, well, it, it, so you don't have like this feedback with the cable anymore, and I guess you would not be using like more. So theoretically, is I mean the setup that Roberta was showing in the sense that you have bin splitter, mm -hmm. uh, you have part of the signal that is measurement measured, and on the other output is going back. You have to feed back on the on the system itself. That could be that you have a second part of your Nonlinear, nonlinear process. So you have the, for example, I mean, in our case, it's just that uh, you have the pump coming that is generating, for example, this nonlinear process, and then you have to inject back also part of the signal that come out uh, from the that you recover from uh, the the bis splitter, which is not impossible. It's a little bit hard to do, but it's possible. Okay. Uh, I have a question. 
Oh, yes. <laughs> Question online. Please go ahead. With the, in the case of the quantum reservoir, of course, when we, uh, when then one does a measure, uh, you lose the quantum superposition and so on. And does this affect the quantum reservoir? And if so, um, how can one try to make a measurement to not completely destroy the quantum reservoir? Uh, yes, actually, I mean, I, I didn't really show what is going to be uh, the setup that we are going to use for the quantum reservoir. Uh, also, because we are discussing what could be the best, uh, the best case. For sure, there will be a, a bit splitter at, uh, at, at certain, uh, certain points. So the idea is that there is part of the information that can be used. You can think about it as a weak measurement in the sense that you measure part of the system, but part of the system is not made. Also because you have a multi, if you think in the case of the multi-mode case where we have different frequency modes, you can find a way you have a nonlinear speaker that extracts just one mode. It exists, it's hard to do, but you can do. Uh, and you measure this one, and you don't measure the other one. Uh, so for sure, this mode is going to be entangled with the other mode, but probably not all of them. For example, it's the case of cluster states, uh, in which you have link that are, I mean, you have correlation that, that do not go so far in the sense that if you touch a node, you just destroy a node, but not the other one. And uh, so this could be a kind of configuration that could work. OK, thank you. And also, um, still related to this, um, you said that you can extract uh, some of the frequencies, but of course, in a realistic case, there will be some uh, uh, sort of bleeding from one frequency to the other, meaning that you still will lose, uh, with each measurement, part of the reservoir. Are there some estimates with like today's technology of um, how big how big is the limit for the re reservoir become before it becomes um, unfeasible to maintain it? And I'm not sure that I got all the question, but uh, so the, 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 mode, the mode sorting could be done uh, easily in some configuration. So for example, if you are in a wavelength basis, you just use a grating, you separate a different wavelength, and you, have, you just measure one and the other one that just, I mean, goes. Uh, and then I don't know, from, from the theory, Robert, you want to say? I think that the key part is the being split, because part of the light you measure it and the rest remains inside. Then on the part that you measure, you can decide if you want to measure some frequency mode or all frequency mode, but you are not losing the one reservoir because part of the lab is remaining inside the system and the, and the system is, uh, is continuously pumped. So, so it's uh, because you are continuously injecting light with the input. So it, it's sustained, it, it's not, uh, it is not uh, dying in the measurement in this case. But in a sense, it's some contradiction to the idea of these echo state networks, right? Because in echo state networks, you you adjust output layer without changing the reservoir, right? But in quantum case, especially if you have an argument, so by measurement you change the reservoir, so it's a, still can, can work. I'm not saying anything, but it yes, is. Yes, uh, you have a feedback. So the, the architecture is actually different. I mean, it is inspired by by the. the the map is completely different from the one of the preceding network. Even in this very simple case, it is a quadratic electronium, it's different. And it's true, you have feedback. So the measurement itself is part of the reception of the map. While in the classical case, this is the main difference. The measurement is just something that happened on the top of it and it doesn't perturb anything. There was a question over there. Yes. Yeah. I have a question about the feedback and the way you implement that. Uh, so your whole like measurement impacts the electrode function, right? And I was wondering how do you select for a relation between the whole that measurement and the electrode function? Something very important about the input plane as well. Yes, actually, uh, so the this is the receipt in the sense that actually uh, this is the, the the thing that you select. So these are the inputs. Uh, data and the input data are set, I mean, on the phase of the field that is at the output of UN. But actually, you have this alpha and beta. This alpha and beta, uh, I mean, are the two terms that mix the input and the what is measured from the homodyne that is measuring the sinus of this relation. Okay, 
And actually, yes, you train uh, by, I mean, changing this. So you, I mean, you get beta and alpha by training. Uh, the, there is the parameter that you use. Yeah, there was another question. Uh, yeah, I would like to ask someone. Okay. You mentioned uh, um, there was some characterization made on, on the lasers, like the pump lasers used, um, um, and uh, there was some learning being done about it. Um, yeah, there. So, um, yeah, you, I think you mentioned that there was some way in which noise was changing, that there was perhaps something you could learn about it. So, I, I don't know if you could uh, help me understand a little bit more because I know that uh, noise is well, it's non deterministic and there is, you, you cannot really learn uh, noise. But, but there's some, there's a variety of patterns that you can learn about how noise changes. So it's a little bit confusing, but I don't know if uh, there's something deterministic about, about the so, noise properties of um, yeah, it's a good question. Good, good, good question. I'm not sure that I could, could give the full answer because it's going to take it. I'm not the most expert in any case. I didn't do this experiment, but... Um, so, of course, the noise of the pump is stochastic itself. It could come from mechanics, whatever, I mean, oscillation. But then, I mean, there is uh, some nonlinear link to the noise of the parameter of the lasers. But then you have other stochastic things that come in the sense that you have uh, other noise uh, in the... Uh, in the noise parameter that comes up from the laser. So the idea is that you are, in any case, in this uh, kind of noise plus noisy scenario, you're able to, to, to um, learn during the time. It's really, I mean, during, while you are doing the time series, you learn, I mean, you're able to uh, forecast what is going to come later by just knowing the no one of the noise inputs, which of course is the main noise, but it's not the only one. I don't know if I, I get yeah, the no, difference. So Again, this was a suggestion of Miguel, because we already did this kind of experiment in other setup. I mean, it's known that the reservoir computing that is, I mean, can, is able to learn this chaotic time in a way. Not, this is not really chaotic, but you can also learn chaotic time series. So this is interesting. Can, can I try to answer sure. discussion? So uh, uh, there's some, you deal with uh, channel compensation, right? Mm -hmm. where, you, where you have white Gaussian noise, and then you have signal noise mixture, so you have um, noise with not really white uh, features. But, and I think it is here because you have some white noise, but because pump is laser on linear system, it is it has also some deterministic features. Yes. In a sense, it is the same problem as you deal with channel equalization or pump equalization. Thank you very much. No. Okay, I to just close a nice discussion and thanks a lot again. Uh, for the so, do you want to say something about the lunch? It's uh, downstairs. It's downstairs. Okay. I think we left a board about the schedule. So, yes. Okay. Yeah. Can we leave it here? Or I think it's yes. Okay. Thanks for changing the morning. I can change